Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. So last night was spirited. A little bit. In a game where Detroit was missing like four of its top five players, four of its top six players, whatever, Hellberg was in, Larkin out. I thought, ugh, it's going to be a snoozer. It's going to be a stinker. <laughs> Ryan Reeves made sure we all had a uh, an interesting night. Can I read to you the most surprising DM that I've ever had? And I'm going to I'm I'm going to sound like I'm kidding, but I genuinely love this DM so much. I love the person who sent it to me. This is amazing. This is how I want every. I won't spoil it. Is it from Ryan Reeves? No, it's not from Revo, no. Uh, this person said, basically, they had some kind words, said, uh, not really a big fan of Red Wings Twitter, uh, like what you guys do, though, but your take on that hit tonight sucks. And then they had a whole, like, they, they explained their position very politely and everything. And then they wrapped it up, said, um, anyways, like, big fan of what you guys do, keep it up, just thought, you, just thought I'd tell you that your tweet sucked. <laughs> and I read that, I went, this is the best criticism I have ever had. Like, I am all for, you know, people calling me out if I'm wrong or they disagree on Twitter. That's what it's for. Like, that's what my mentions are for. I generally don't get, like, mad when people disagree with me other than what are we doing other than pontificating. That's not what we're here for. And I just love the juxtaposition of, hey, big fan of the of what you guys do. You're stupid and wrong tonight. And I'm like, hell yeah, dude. Like, <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I'm like, hell yeah. That is exactly the kind of... Uh, a disagreeing DM I love to receive. So, you know what? Internet's getting a little bit better, dare I say. Did you check the rest of your mentions nah, last night? don't worry about all that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. Uh, this is a, a off-schedule episode of the Winged Wheel podcast. We're recording earlier in the afternoon than usual, so uh, no Winged Wheel podcast after dark vibes tonight, but we are able to, to kind of cover all the mayhem of the last couple of games uh, closer to the time it happened. So, Without further ado, I am one of the hosts of the Winged Wheel podcast, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And not here to cover all of the uh, violence that he loves to see in hockey is Evan Lobsinger. He's uh, away until next episode. He would have had, oh man, Evan would have had a field day with this one. That's what he gets for going on vacation. He is our boomer window. He absolutely is. I'm, I'm going to have to look through that window today now. Yeah, you you will. <laughs> On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we have a couple games to cover that the Red Wings played, first against Carolina, and then uh, the game last night against Minnesota, quite obviously, is going to be the topic of a lot of people's conversation, including ours. Uh, we'll be talking about the Red Wings and their injury list, which is long. Uh, it'll probably take us half the episode just to read it, and what that means for their season moving forward. Uh, we have a special interview this episode. Apologies to Allison Lucan. Usually when uh, we have her on... We try to time it where you know nothing else has happened. We thought these would be this would be a little bit of a quieter episode, quieter episode in terms of news, uh, but don't let that guest spot be drowned out. Allison brought us some phenomenal, phenomenal stuff uh, from what's happening out in Seattle and her great work in hockey storytelling that is uh, data driven. So really, really happy to have Allison Lucan back on the show. And then news from the NHL uh, board of governor meetings, everything from the salary cap to digital ads to the play in series to potential schedule changes, and then uh, there's, you know, Ely Tolvanen got picked up way later than we thought in the waiver process, and then whatever else we get to before overtime, if we can even cover all that today. Before that, uh, a couple things to let you know. First of all, if you're a Patreon supporter of the show, um, patreon.com slash podcast, if you are, are interested, a uh, quick notice for you, check uh, Patreon. There's a post on how to update your address. If you need to update your address or if you haven't in a while, I recommend that you do so ASAP. Uh, there might be a little bit of something coming your way, uh, so make sure that address is up to date. Secondly, uh, flannels. Winged Wheel Podcast, Mickey Redmond's signature custom flannels are still available. There are, I kid you not, I think like four left. There are a couple in size small and a couple in size double XL. So yeah, four left, or sorry, two size small and two three XLs, and that's all we have left. So if you want one and you 
want to get a gift for the holidays or Christmas for someone in that size, either of those sizes, or you want one for yourself, now is your opportunity. Wingedwheelpodcast.com slash shop. A portion of the proceeds benefits the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Also in benefit of the Jamie Daniels Foundation, Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA. What's that? It's an event that we run in partnership with the Detroit Red Wings, uh, where we host a live podcast uh, prior to a Red Wings game. Uh, we've done them at the arena. We've done them at Hockey Town Cafe. Uh, and they fe- they have featured special guests like Ken Daniels and Mickey Redmond. Uh, there's going to be a Q&A, meet and greet with the hosts, the, the special guests, merch, giveaways, prizes, things like that. And then we all watch the Red Wings game at the LCA together. Your, t- your ticket gets you access to that pregame episode and the actual Red Wings game, plus it's discounted. You got a special WWP discount. Uh, in addition, a portion of the proceeds from each ticket sold will benefit the Jamie Daniels Foundation. You're going to sit in uh, Winged Wheel podcast-specific seating sections, and then we're going to have a couple other goodies and surprises in there for you. So DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP to get your tickets. It's on Saturday, April 8th. That's the Pittsburgh game. So Saturday, April 8th, DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. Okay, let's keep the Carolina game summary short because, first of all, nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. That was a game, another night, wherein Ole Mata was out. The Red Wings were coming up against a Carolina team. The Red Wings were at home, but they are coming up against a Carolina team that excelled or sorry, excels in disrupting play. Defensive stalwarts, breaking up your possession, breaking up your transition, et cetera, et cetera. It was a one nothing game. Vili Husso stopped all but one shot and lost. A one nothing game in this high-scoring NHL where seemingly, Brad, you can probably net 18 goals between now and the end of the season if you get put on a top line somewhere. There was nothing to that game. The Red Wings didn't have the execution. Carolina played their game. They were a much more talented team. Uh, Detroit wasn't able to do much. They had some moments where they looked kind of threatening, but for all Detroit's 27 shots, it's been the story that it's been for the last while. The amount of high danger chances were minimal. Uh, They were talking about it on the broadcast. Like, don't be fooled by the shot count. Like, Carolina is intentionally making it, so those are low opportunity shots. Those are not really scary scoring chances for... um, uh, Kochikov, who had a second straight shutout that game. Carolina played their game, dictated the way the game was played, and ended up sneaking away with a one nothing win. You ever see a piece of information, you don't save it because you don't think too much of it, and then all of a sudden it becomes very relevant very fast and you're mad you didn't save it? Yeah. So I, I forget which um, hockey analytics guru tweeted it, but that morning they had uh, it was one of those charts, just the quadrants, what what style of hockey is a team playing? Dull, bad, good, and fun? Yeah. The Red Wings were on an island in dull. <laughs> they were, like, comfortably the most boring team in the league. And then there was another one I saw where it was penalties, differentials, and, like, chippiness factor in a game. Red Wings were, again, comfortably um, right near the most boring teams in the league. And then that game happens that night. It's nice to have improved, and I would rather take boring and better than fun and terrible. But in a lot of ways, this team is unwatchable, and that game kind of well, was the poster child for it. Usually boring and better means that your overall style of play is going to be you know, boring. Like you said, not a lot of high-danger opportunities. And what do you rely on to win those games, Brad? Turnovers mistakes capitalizing on chances exactly turnovers mistakes and capitalizing on big moments so you're not going to get a ton of big moments but you need your best players to capitalize when you get them a red wings team with larkin bertuzzi verana you know raymond clicking uh, your offensive weapons though not plentiful they're still good this isn't the red wings of like five years ago you have actual real weapons that are you know to some teams the envy uh like they're envious of the kind of players that the red wings have not overall lineup but those players but and you can get by on that you can get by playing an altogether boring game and just relying on those guys breaking through when it matters but if you don't even have those guys there then yeah you're going to be losing one nothing games to teams who want to make you lose one nothing we can talk for hours about that we have a lot else this episode the biggest takeaway is that whatever hockey gods are up there 
are playing a sick joke on the Red Wings. Dylan Larkin blocked a shot, took a, a puck to the hand, and is now out. There's no update on how long he's out. He was out for the... He it happened in, or I think, the first period. He came back, and by the third period, he had left again. Um, so very obviously tried to play through it. The pain was too much. And you have to imagine with the kinds of you know pain management solutions, let's say, that these guys have, for him to come back and say, no, no, it's still too much, it had to have been gnarly. Missed the Minnesota game, and that was a certainty by the time... Lalone came in for his post game presser. He had already said uh, Larkin's not coming playing tomorrow against Minnesota, and uh, Larkin is seeking a specialist. Or at least that was the last update. So it doesn't look like he's going to be back next game. Let's put it that way. This season, and I'm I'm really not trying to be melodramatic here. We're going to talk about it again in a little bit. But if if the Red Wings lose Larkin for any serious amount of time. This season is looking grim, and it, this happened quickly. Yeah, it's so hard to get a feel for a, a lot of things because, A, well, when you have this many injuries, nothing is clear. But with Verona, you don't know, you can't know, you don't want to ask what's going on. So that could be a few weeks, that could be a few months. And there's no update yeah. there. No, and Helene St. James reported today that, you know, a couple months in, the Red Wings are still hoping to hear something maybe from the Players Association of the League. So everyone is still very much in yeah. the dark on this. Yeah, nobody knows anything. We don't know yet if Larkins is long-term. We know Bertuzzi's out about another month, and there's also a high likelihood Bertuzzi's a deadline casualty anyway. Fabry is still out for a couple more weeks, and then when he comes back, you know it's going to take some time for him to get geared up. We don't know how long Heronik's going to be out for because with head injuries, you just never know. Yeah. Like, there's a scenario here where Larkin's day-to-day, Bertuzzi comes back on schedule, Fabry comes back pretty close to his old self, Heronik's is not that serious, and then again with Verona, not to speculate, but let's just say he's back in the next, you know, week, a few weeks to a month. And this is right. a hypothetical. Hypothetical, best case. yeah. This is hypothetical on everything, and nothing changes. We are talking about the Red Wings going into April, competing for a playoff spot. You know, ever everything's great. We've got this great new improved team. If Larkin's out long term, Veronik's out long term. If Bertuzzi is in fact out for another month in a deadline casualty. Heronik's out for a while. Verona's not back for a while. Like, it sounds so awful to say how quickly it says. We could be talking about Connor Bedard in three to four weeks. Yeah. It, it, the, we literally could. The variance in what could happen from the Red Wings season yeah. is insane. And you know why this is happening, Brad? Because we kept a- talking about consistency. Yeah. And then just the universe is like, ha, we're going to take that right out of your hands. Anyhow. We'll but, talk. We'll talk more about that in a yeah. second. Let's talk about how they got to not having Heronic. <laughs> I'm, I'm muting and making all my social <laughs> accounts private after this. The Minnesota Wild game. Uh, it ultimately ended up being a four-one loss, where uh, Elmer Soderblom, who was called up, obviously with Larkin being out, the Red Wings needed whatever scrap of offense they could get. He made a great play uh, and was the Red Wings' sole goal scorer. Uh, made the game 2-1 at one point, but that's as close as it got. But the the whole story of the game was very, very early on. And the way the story unfolded was this. Uh, Reeves and Hironic got tangled up on the sideboards near center ice, uh, you know, holding each other's sticks, kind of pushing and shoving a little bit, skated away, whatever. The puck was in the Red Wings zone. The Red Wings were looking to break out. Philip Hironic standing dead center, Uh, calls for the puck, gets it, starts to skate up right up the middle of the ice, is looking forward, and then looks behind him as Ryan Reeves was lining him up. Ryan Reeves steps in, and before Hirona could even reach the blue line, Ryan Reeves absolutely blows him up on a massive, massive, massive hit. Hironic was hurt, bleeding, uh, no penalty called on the play. And Hronik left the game and didn't come back. There were reports that he tried to return, but the doctor very obviously told him no. I've 
actually moved a bit on this hit. My opinions on it. I've been thinking about it a lot last night. I thought about it a lot today. Uh, I understand. And the the NHL came out today, said there's not even going to be a review for the supplemental discipline. So they agree with the referee's assessment on the ice that it wasn't uh, uh, worth penalizing. But still, I've moved around a lot on this. Brad, your take on the hit. All right. So I'm going to start by saying... After I'm done talking and while I'm talking, please, everybody listen closely, because when you yell at me afterwards, please, all I ask is argue the point I'm making. I do. 10 out of 10 doctors do recommend yelling yeah. at Brad, but yeah. do hear him out. Yeah, but please yell at me for the points I'm actually making. I'll start with the hit itself, because this was I, I was every time a hit like this happens, there's usually this debate about did he get him in the head did he get him in the chest and actually it was all pretty civil last night everybody was like yeah he hit him directly in the face whether that was his shoulder uh, you know bicep area it doesn't matter it's head contact and everybody's yelling is it a penalty is it a penalty this isn't called in the nhl this is not a penalty i i agree with the ref not calling a penalty with the league not suspending him because that's never been called. Truba laid almost an identical hit on Athens to see you a couple weeks ago. Wasn't called because this isn't a penalty in the NHL. It's a penalty in international hockey. That if that was, you know, a Team Canada versus Czech Republic game, Reeves is out of the game. But that is not the rule in the NHL. So let me get that right out of the way. I'm not calling for Reeves to be suspended. I'm not even mad at Ryan Reeves. This is his job. This is his role. This is why he's on the ice. He is simply doing what the organization asks him to do. Yeah. So I have absolutely. That's why they brought him in. Yeah. I have absolutely no problem with Ryan Reeves doing this. But I, that all being said, I have a huge problem with this hit because this should be a penalty in the rule book. It's not, but it should be. I've been a proponent for years and years and years. Don't take fighting out of the game. Don't take hitting out of the game. But we need to take headshots out of the game because I don't know why everybody is so eager to have great players get concussed all the time and have careers cut short. And who knows? Maybe Philip Peronik plays again in a week. He does. Maybe he doesn't play in three months. Ryan Reeves, as a hockey player, is useless. Philip Peronik is one of the biggest breakout stars in the NHL this year. How is this situation good for the NHL? It's not. Now, how do you change that rule? What's Reeves supposed to do there? He's like an inch or two taller than Hironik. You can't tell me he couldn't get him in the chest. He absolutely could. This is not to absolve Hironik. I don't care if Reeves is on the ice or not. If you're skating slowly up the center of the ice with your head down, looking around, looking behind you, you're getting lit up, and you should get lit up. Yes, because it's a grown man's league. Yes. And you cannot... This isn't like... We hope yeah. Philip Peronik is okay and come, come back yeah. soon, but you absolutely yeah. never, ever... Kids, if you're listening and you play in a... Even if you don't play in a contact league, never skate with your head down, especially not down the middle of the ice. There, it will be punishing. Yeah. Now, I know you mentioned something off air about Hironik might have been turning around to see if Helberg was going to the bench because he thought there might have been a delayed penalty, but either way, it doesn't That's matter. still not an excuse. Yeah, you, you still have to be aware of your surroundings, you know, Again, I'm not looking at this through Red Wings colored glasses. If I'm a Minnesota Wild player and I see Hironik coming up the ice like that, I'm going to send him to the moon. Like, that's hockey. But you can do that cleanly. You can hit him in the chest. I This whole sh stuff <laughs> about... Oh, oh, the the hockey pl hockey's really fast. How's he supposed to... That, that argument is BS. You control your body on the ice way more than people seem to think you can. Reeves could have got him in the chest there easily. He could have bent his knees more, hinged at the hips more. It was possible. So don't give me that argument. Again, and I started this by saying I don't think he should be penalized because as it's written now, it's a rule. But again, my... First problem, as I laid out, was this should be a penalty in the books, and this should be an automatic ejection. All head hits should be out, because you can do that without getting rid of hitting. As much as people refuse to believe that, trust me, you can. And my other big problem with this hit, in terms of the reaction, was people blaming Heronic, saying, oh, what's Reeves supposed to do? Heronic had his head down. 
Listen, you are right. Philip Heronic should have his head up. He should not have put himself in that position. I agree. But the onus, the responsibility is still on Ryan Reeves to not hit him in the face. The analogy I was telling Ryan before we started recording <laughs> that I compared this to is if you're at a bar and you get into a bar fight with a guy and a guy pulls a knife on you and you look at him in the eye and go, what are you going to do? Stab me? <laughs> That's one of the stupidest things you could say in that scenario. And then he stabs you. He's still the one going to jail, even though what you did was extremely stupid. So like I said, what Heronic did was dumb, but Reeves is still at fault for hitting him in the face, just like the guy would be at fault for stabbing you in the bar. That's all I ask. Yes, both things can be true at the same time, so don't let that be your only argument. Yeah, the the two things can be true is what it boils down to. So I'll tell you where I think I missed the mark last night. My initial reaction was, in full transparency, my initial reaction was based on the, the little tussle they had earlier, uh, and the fact that I I felt and still feel mostly that Ryan Reeves elevated up a little bit during the hit, like hit, that's where his momentum was going. I felt that it was a little bit targeted. Um, and I initially put it out that the principal point of contact was to the head. And that was a mistake by me, I should say, because it was the first point of contact, but principal in the rule book is used as main. And I think the rule book is written in such a way, and I think it's done intentionally, where that's a big gray area because you can easily say because of Heronic's motion of looking away from Ryan Reeves, which again, it's like looking away from a train on the tracks coming towards you and back, he was leaned forward. You're right, Brad. It's not the size difference that caused Heronic's head to be at, at that level compared to, to Reeves. It was the fact that he was leaning forward and unprepared for the hit. Essentially Reeves hit Heronic as if Heronic had never looked away and was bracing for the content. Ronick still would have been blown up. I understand things happen at game speed. I actually would contend a little bit that some credence needs to be given to that, and it must have been shocking for Reeves coming down on those tracks and seeing Ronick look away and go, whoa, he should not be doing this. Reeves doesn't move that fast at the best of times, and he was not going that fast on that play. Still, NHL rule 48.1, a hit resulting in contact with an opponent's head where the head was the main point of contact and such contact to the head was avoidable is not permitted. So basically what they're saying is, was the contact to the head unavoidable? And that's what you're saying, Brad. Under yep. the rules, this was okay because yep. there's enough of an argument based on the size of Reeves, and but mostly how Heronic looked away and then leaned forward that even though the motion of the hit, Reeves got him in the head first, he still drove... I would contend through the head and the body. Minnesota fans and folks who think it was a, a completely clean hit would say he drove completely through the body. It doesn't matter. You can't say that he hit the head and only the head, and so it's clean. I was not surprised to, to, to see no supplemental discipline. Where I've moved on this hit, where I've kind of come to is, yeah, there, there, it cannot be overstated how much Philip Perona cannot be putting himself in that position. It doesn't matter if you think there's a delayed penalty. It doesn't matter if, you know, you hear someone yell, hey, Phil, like you rely on your teammates to communicate and you always keep your eyes up skating down the gut like that, especially while Ryan Reeves is on the ice. His sole job, like you said, Brad, is to go out there and be a punishing physical presence. That's his value as a hockey player. And so, so long as the rules are written like this, he does have value. And so you have to respect that as an opponent on the ice, especially when you just tussled with him on the other side of the ice. Darren McCarty put it really well. You put it really well, Brad, I think. Ryan Reeves did his job there. I think there was an era in hockey where that hit was way more accepted and clean and common, and that's what McCarty talked about. Um, it, for me, it was still a little bit too much head contact where I look at that and think, I wish that I wish it wasn't. I agree with you, Brad. I wish it wasn't legal. But as it's written right now, my biased argument, my Red Wings colored lens, uh, glasses argument is that he his momentum was up 
upwards. He didn't flare his elbow out. He didn't necessarily jump. His skates came off the ice like a couple inches, maybe like how Cronwell's hits used to. Yeah, you hit the body and then the momentum takes him up. It's You're not jumping into the hit. I just, I wish, I wish that Reeves would have made the adjustment to say, hey, this is a player who's put himself in a dumbass, vulnerable position. Instead of that upwards momentum, which is still legal right now, I'll just drive straight through him. He would have rocked him like Dustin Bufflin used to rock people. Just drive straight through him. It's just that little bit of upward motion that still is, is irked me. But yeah, by but I thought about it all night and I thought about it again today and I thought, yeah, unfortunate, terrible position. Um, but you can't expect Ryan Reeves on the ice there to do anything differently. I would expect him to have a cleaner hit because, you know, there's this code amongst... Well, there's no enforcers, but there's this anymore other than him. But there's this code of respect amongst players. You can't look at that hit and say there's any respect there. You can hit him cleanly. So I don't I don't want to hear any garbage about this boomer window code. And believe me, I live and die by that boomer window code. Yeah. And I'll, when we talk about the Red Wings response, I'll get into that because I think... We should get into that next. Yeah, because my, my answer here versus what I'm going to say there are going to feel very contradictory. It's going to feel and, like two different brads, which is everyone's nightmare. Yeah, which is, you know, philosophically. But, I mean, yeah, if you want to talk about is the respect in the game, when you see stuff like that, no. That's not. You're potentially ending a guy's career, you know, if... Hronik had a couple of these hits already, or if he has a couple more, now we're talking about CTE and altering a man's life. Like, clean hit by the rule books? Sure. Absolutely. Anybody wants to say that's a clean hit, should not be a penalty, should not be a suspension, I agree with you. Anybody wants to say Hronik's got to skate through the middle of the ice with his head up? I agree with you. It doesn't mean I have to like any of it, though. It doesn't mean I have to like the rules. It doesn't mean I think there's any respect in that. Again, circling back to the first thing I said. This is the point I'm making. Hronik can be in the wrong. The rules can be legal. Doesn't mean I have to like it. It's I'm I'm really trying to look at this without bias. I really am. And I think back my, to my defense on that is I've made this point about non Red Wings plays. Well, I, I like imagine this is Philip Cron or Philip Cron Nicholas Cronwell making that hit. We would have been absolutely taking the other minutia on the other side of this very thin line or, or murky gray area to justify the hit. The other point of that is Cronwell got away with some of these and Cronwell was actually suspended for some of these that I think were a little bit less got suspended than, for a game seven because of one of these. So it's not a perfect standard. Um, I don't want to see, I don't want to see an NHL where guys can skate down the middle with their heads down without respecting the fact that your opponent our opponent will clobber you. I don't I love big hits and I know people might call me, you know, archaic for that, but I, I, I don't want to see that part of hockey go away. I think your job as it doesn't even have to be just defensemen, like Reeves, if a player is going to not respect the physicality of the game, it's a big man's league. You need there needs to be the physical component to make sure that, you know, you're playing the grown man's game. But yeah, I, I see what you're saying, Brad. It doesn't mean you have to like like that was a violent, violent, violent hit. I would love to find a an area in the rules where you can still have hits that are punishing. It doesn't even matter what the outcome of the hit is. Like, who's to say if Reeves hit him completely clean the way we described that Hronik still wouldn't got hurt? There probably would have been. Oh, the He's way a the, Mack truck. Yeah, the back of his head hit the ice too after he got hit. I mean, you hit a guy in the chest, that could still happen. Yeah. Like I'm not I'm with you. I'm not advocating for a no contact league, a no risk league. All I'm advocating for is don't hit him in the head. That that's that's almost my entire argument. Don't hit him in the head. We and, we, we now know what concussions and repeated blows to the head do to people, especially when they get into retirement. I just I don't see an argument for me, and I don't know why everybody's so eager to allow that to happen to guys. Again, hit him in the chest, hit him in the shoulder, barrel him into the boards. You know, like I, I get it, and like I again, I'm I'm more boomer window than I am. <laughs> yeah modern hockey man honestly um but yeah you can't you just you can't and i don't know why everybody is so eager to justify it well let's talk about the red wings response now and i know you had lack, some feelings lack of well we are we actually have some different opinions on this so you go ahead yeah because i've got a horrible opinion on this but <laughs> i'm gonna call it up and everybody probably should disagree with me but Understand I'm taking this uh, not necessarily what I think should happen or what, because, again, I 
there's parts of the hockey code that I absolutely hate. This is one of them. But this is how every hockey locker room in the world feels and operates. The fact that nobody stuck up for Hronik, that's not going to feel great to Hronik. Now, here's your catch-22. Ryan Reeves is a unicorn in the NHL. He's the only guy like that. There's not anybody on the Red Wings who's not getting absolutely dummied by him in a fight. Yeah, I saw some people say, I wish Giovanni Smith was here. Ooh, Smith was here. Hey, I love Giovanni Smith, and I love what he does when he's on the Red Wings. He wouldn't have stood a chance. In a, in a full tilt with Reeves, unlike Sherratt's where they just kind of fell and stumbled around, in a full tilt, Giovanni Smith is losing every tooth in his head. There's no player in this league who could tune up Ryan Reeves the way some fans wanted him to yeah. be tuned up. I'm sorry. It sucks because it's not fair. If you're an angry Red Wings fan, it's not fair. Yeah. Brad, we can put me, you, and Evan and combine us into one Megazord person, and we'd still be in the hospital halfway through a punch. Yeah, a, a thousand percent. So I agree there should be a response by the Red Wings. You have to. You have to back up your teammate. But at the same time, I agree. You can't fight Ryan Reeves because all that's going to do is now there's potentially a second Red Wing hurt, and Minnesota's just going to be even more fired up. Congratulations. You've now failed twice. What needed to happen here to keep the locker room energized and to stand up and what's happened in hockey for decades. Again, let me preface this by saying, I know this is stupid and this is one of the big problems with hockey culture. Philip Ronick's what at worst, the top three, top four player on the Red Wings this season. Mm -hmm. The Red Wings should have tuned up one of the Minnesota wilds, top three, four players. The next time Kaprizov was on the ice, not, he should have been run legally. I'm not, not saying hit him in the head, but well, Mo Sider was laying into him pretty good. Sider was doing his best, which was good. But it needed to be a little more frequent, prevalent, for lack of a better word, obvious. Yeah, it like needs to be a message. Sent. You're sending a message, not only to your teammate that you have his back, but you're sending a message to the Minnesota Wild, and more directly, Ryan Reeves, saying, hey, you're going to run around and hurt our players? Guess what? Tell Kirill to stay on the bench because the same thing's going to happen to him. Like, for all all this talk about enforcers are in the game to prevent this type of dumb shit from happening, my argument's always been backwards because guys like Ryan Reeves caused this shit to happen, and last night was the perfect example of that. So, the Red Wings didn't do much. Ben Sherratt finally did something in the second period, and Sherratt actually had a very aggressive game and was all over the place. I really liked his game yesterday. Um, and, you know... Huge stick taps to him for trying. Oh, so much respect. Even, yeah, even Reeves God. said, I have a lot of respect for him stepping up and doing it. Yeah, and because Reeves knows what a killer he is. Yeah. Like he, Reeves is very self-aware. Like, And I also, for those who might not be familiar with, with fighting, it's not a mistake that they it was such a weird, messy, everyone's falling over. Like And Sherratt, like basically took a cheap shot to get one in first. Sherratt did what he had to do to protect himself. Because if that was a stand-up, every both guys get a, a clean option, Sherratt would have been on the ice. Yeah, and the, he knows that. Yeah, you could have added Ben Sherratt to the Red Wings injured list right now, and they cannot afford to lose Ben Sherratt to the injured list right now. So, you know, hockey culture is archaic, stupid, but you, you have to stand up for your teammates. If the opposition is running around trying to hurt your guys, and again, Ryan Reeves' mere existence in Minnesota is proof that they are going to try and hurt you. You got to fight fire with fire, and I hate it. I hate it, but you have to. To that end, I think this was a big big game for Mo Sider. He woke up, forget, you know, the the kind of plays that he was making, and he made some really good defensive plays, especially down the wire the last five minutes as the Red Wings are trying to make an impact on the ice and even up the score. Uh, just physically, the kind of presence he brought to the game, something in Mo Sider woke up that game, and it's really hard to draw a silver lining in a game where you see one of Detroit's best players this season join a very fat injured list already. But the silver lining is Mo Sider stepped up as a leader on this team and decided he was going to make an impact on this game. And he did. He threw a hit of his own, which, uh, uh, if you look at the replay, was also dirty. It should have been an elbowing penalty for oh, sure. Oh, yeah, 100%. Uh, was leaning into Kaprizov, was was absolutely drawing back. He did his best to not fail the punk test on his own. Again, respect to Sherratt for stepping in. That's why he, that's one of the reasons why Sherratt was brought in for veteran leadership. There's a no-win scenario for the Red Wings there when Ryan Reeves is having his way with your team. And Sherratt did the most that you could in terms of of answering the bell. So those were things that I like to see. Um, I think the Red Wings walked away. I, I know people got on Wallman and people got on a lot of the other guys. You might be right. I just don't see how you willingly go in unless you can catch 
someone like Ryan Reeves off guard. If you go in and fight, you're asking to be injured. And I don't know. Yeah, you always want to stand up for your teammate. Always, always, always. But this isn't just anyone. It's not Giovanni Smith on the other side. It's not, you know, uh, Steele or someone else. Whoever you consider to be tough, it's, it's one of the most notoriously tough, dangerous players in terms of their physicality in the modern era of the NHL. Yeah, like I said, you can make that point without fighting Ryan Reeves. Yeah. You shouldn't fight Ryan Reeves. I loved Siders and Sherratt's response to the rest of the game. Those guys were in it. They understood the assignment. My question is, what were the other 16 guys doing? Because I've been in games like this this season. Yeah, I've thrown four hits in my life. Like That is not part of my game. All of those hits this year were in the one game we had that got out of hand because they ran one of our guys early. And I'm not out there trying to fight guys. I'm not out there trying to hurt guys. But when a game gets like that, there are no flybys. Everybody is finishing every damn check on every damn player in every damn corner of the ice. Yeah. What? Where was at? Like, not. I'm gonna name two guys that this would apply to. But where was Adam Ernie? Where was Michael Rasmussen? These are guys who should have been finishing every check, hard hits. Guys who could, who are big enough with a few hits could probably send a message. If every time you put it, pick a good Minnesota defenseman, Matt Dumba's corner. If every time you put it in his corner, you're tr- you're running him into the boards, he's going to get very sick of that. Yeah. And do you think he's going to be quiet about that? No. So his teammates are going to know he's sick of that. Like, it's hockey. You do what you can within the rules without being dirty. Again, I'm not saying go sucker punch someone, go knee a guy, go hit him in the head. But... If that's the type of game they want, and again, I can't stress this enough, Ryan Reeves being on their roster is all you need to know about what their intentions are for every game they play. You have to respond in kind. Through all of that, Brad, we didn't even talk about that the Minnesota game was Helberg's start. They actually started Helberg in that game. Uh, Ned was backing him up. Huso got the night off. Overshadowed completely, completely the fact that Helberg played that game. Yep. Hey, we talked about it last episode, though. We got ahead of it saying if he was ever going to start, that would be the game. That's the one that made the most sense, and it happened. So wait, for once, Ryan, we were ahead of the curve. Yeah, that's why <laughs> That's why we didn't address it off the hop. He did fine. I, I, he not, was all right. Not remarkable. I think that one of them he'd want back, but it's not like the, the storyline of the game, the flow of the game, everything kind of got away anyways, where... You know, the Red Wings are down two of their most important defensemen. Sherratt was in the box for five minutes at one point. He didn't give up four in the first period. So, yeah. you know, that's an upgrade on some games this season. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's talk about the Red Wings now and what they're dealing with in terms of injuries. Philip Ronick now out with a concussion. We don't know how long. He did try to come back to the game, but anyone who's had a concussion knows that's not necessarily an indication that it was a light one. Uh, Dylan Larkin shot to the hand, ruled out the rest, uh, ruled out for the next game immediately seeking a specialist. That's probably not going to be short term. Bertuzzi is going to be out for, I don't know, at least another four weeks around there. Jacob Verana, the Red Wings haven't even heard news on him. They're st- the Red Wings are hoping for an update. That's three of their best forwards. Some might say they're three best forwards this season based on how Raymond's playing. I think at worst you can say three of their best four forwards in terms of who should be. You have Philip Ronick and, like I mentioned, and Ole Mata has been out with illness. That's your best defensive pairing this season in terms of performance. Are they your best defensemen? No. But in terms of how they've played, yeah, absolutely. The Red Wings are missing a starting line right now. And the best case scenario is that the guy with the concussion is going to be back first. Maybe Ole Mata, depending on what his illness is. This is a bad situation for the Red Wings to be in. These games that they've lost have put them... We've talked about it a lot every time we talk about you know uh, the standings. It is now the 15th, and we use this as the arbitrary measure of are the Red Wings actually going to be a playoff team. The Red Wings are now the second team outside of a wildcard spot. Washington has been on a little run hot... Uh, they've won their last five straight, uh, and they're the first team outside of the wild card spot. Detroit has game in hand, games in hand, sure, but the Red Wings are now on the outside looking in. That's fine. 
if the Red Wings had their full roster, I'd say, hey, they just went through a really tough series of games. They can still stay in this. How do you make that projection with this amount, this amount of injuries, this amount of man games lost, and for the amount of important minutes that are being lost from the top guys being out? This season, like we mentioned before, Brad, could go awry really, really, really quickly. Yeah, and, you know, not through many faults of their own. The last couple games kind of felt like a turning point in the season in a lot of ways, and none of those reasons good. Um, Obviously, injuries being the biggest reason. It's hard to project because until, especially until we know what the timeline is for Larkin and Heronik, if they're both day-to-day, nothing changes status quo. If they're both out long term, let let's say both of them are out for over a month. Yeah. Not to sound harsh, but based on what we've seen the last couple of weeks, it's over. Seasons It would take a miraculous run from which they can't do. They do not have the offense to do that. You would need Raymond to play like his top form from last year. You need Rasmussen to be at the top of his game. Berggren would have to play like Raymond from last year. Yeah, there, it would take such an absolute... And it's hockey. I'm not saying there's no reality in which they can't overcome those injuries. But come on, we've we've been watching. This team's strength is in defense. They can't score. This team's strength is in goaltending. Who so can't score? The Red Are the Red Wings still 31st or 32nd in the league at five-on-five five expected goals. Even with Larkin and Bertuzzi, this team was one of the worst offensive teams in the NHL. Like, oh, man. It's, there's no part of me that looks at this team without Verona, without Bertuzzi, without Hronik, without Larkin. I'll assume Mata's coming back, but he's not an offensive stalwart. For a full month and not plummet out of the playoff race. And that's not like I don't want to sound doom and gloom because it's been such an optimistic season to this point. And there's so many reasons to get excited and to get happy. And to, but man, a team that was struggling to score when they were mostly healthy is screwed when they're arguably their entire top line and their top offensive defensemen are out. Now, again, this could all be this conversation could change tomorrow. They play Ottawa on Saturday. Yeah, if we find out tomorrow, oh yeah, Hronik and Larkin are playing that game. Okay. Every, yeah. Everything I just said is moot. It, it, they'll still have a tough task. The, it's still an uphill climb, but, but they it was always going to be an uphill climb because this roster wasn't built yeah. to be a cup contender, so just getting into the playoffs was at the top of the mountain. And they were doing their damnedest to get there. They were in, doing a pretty good job. Yeah, exactly. Um they were there, again, with a bit of an easier schedule, but still, they were there. They they need, and this is such a cop-out in the game of hockey, they need a damn break. They need some good luck. They like, do. This team has, for how good and how much I'll, I'll argue they've overachieved this year, they have done it with nothing going their way. Nothing. <laughs> they've had to... In com- combine what you were saying before of, you know, they're essentially overachieving. And and so that makes their place in that playoff race fragile. And combine that with what we've talked about in the past, which is, you know, the East is such a Thunderdome in terms of everyone is putting points up in the standings. Look how fast Detroit went from a divisional seat to two points or two spots out of a wild card. Well, um, just for reference on that, for people who want to know how strong the East is, remember that four-game road trip that we were talking about was a huge turning point for the Red Wings? Yeah. And they went 2-1-1? One, and one, Yeah. And we sat here that next episode and went, great. They they did what we expected them to do, probably even a little better. In that four-game stretch, they dropped in the standings. Yeah. That's how competitive the East is. They have a game against Washington coming up. That is going to be pivotal in the wild cards race. They have a game against Tampa coming up. Wait, I, when's that game against Washington? Monday. You know Ovi's getting yes that goal that night. Yeah, we, absolutely. We know how this goes. Yeah. What I mean to say is Detroit has a lot of important games coming up. They have three games against Ottawa throughout the rest of the month. Those might not be relevant, but if they start losing points to Ottawa, then you know they need to capitalize on those. They have games against Washington and Tampa. 
And for different reasons, they need to be capitalizing on those. They absolutely... Pun intended? No, actually. That was <laughs> genuinely pun unintended. They they need to be the kind of team that puts those games away. Pittsburgh, that game could be relevant in terms of um, in terms of a potential wildcard race eventually. We talked about it a lot. This is no longer a time period where the Red Wings can you know, bank on a sweetheart schedule or think that they have no one behind them in the chase. And yeah, it's, they've just had a run bad of luck shots. Pucks to the hand have broken three hands maybe now on the Red Wings this season. It is just an insanely terrible, like (laughs) it's just bullshit. Like you're just like, Oh my, what else do you want from these guys? Um, and the Red Wings are finding themselves in a tough spot. So yeah, all this hinges by next episode. We will hopefully have more clarity on how long Larkin and Hironic are out. Hopefully Mata's not out too much longer with his illness, but if they are to stand a chance in keeping this a conversation even, those three need to be back ASAP. Okay. Before we move forward, I want to let everyone know that this very contentious episode of the Winged Wheel podcast is proudly brought to you by NordVPN. Are you missing out on a game or your favorite show because it's not available in your region? Let me introduce NordVPN. Using NordVPN and a click of a button, you can watch and browse as if you're elsewhere in the world, making sure you never miss a game and can watch whatever content you'd like. No need to travel across the continent or oceans for your favorite team when NordVPN brings them right to you. With over 5,000 server options, no game or show is out of your reach. Using our special link, nordvpn.com slash wingedwheel, you can receive a huge discount on NordVPN's cybersecurity two-year plan, plus four free months. We all love to binge, but privacy is a big deal too. NordVPN keeps your information encrypted so you never have to worry about your IP or location getting out. They've also doubled down on keeping you safe with their new threat protection feature. Say goodbye to intrusive website ads and malware. Even if you download an infected file, threat protection kicks in and deletes it before it makes a mess of your computer. Don't forget, there's literally no risk to you at all with their 30-day money-back guarantee. Give it a try, and if you like it, great. If you don't, they'll issue a refund, and you can pretend the entire thing never even happened. Check out our special link, nordvpn.com slash wingedwheel to get your discounted subscription started today. Okay, folks, uh, before we talk more about the Red Wings, the league, and uh, I'm sure more arguments about hits and whether or not they're legal, we have uh, a little bit of um, a little bit of counterbalance to the negativity of this episode. We have Allison Lucan from the Seattle Kraken uh, and her incredible work on uh, Too Many Men as well. Uh, someone who we've loved to have on the show in the bat, uh, in the past, and it's actually been far too long since we've had her on. Um, genuinely one of the best hockey minds out there. Brad and I have an easy, the easiest time in the world interviewing her because she's just <laughs> she just knows so much and, and handles it all on her own. So without further ado, enjoy this interview with Allison Lucan. Well, I think it's been actually years, so long overdue seems to be uh, underselling it a bit. But folks, we are joined... Uh, very excited to tell you that we're joined once again by Allison Lucan, good friend of the podcast and a contributor and on-air analyst for the Seattle Kraken with Root Sports Northwest and, of course, one-third of the brilliant Too Many Men podcast. Allison, it's so good to have you back on. It's great to be back on. It is crazy. So much has, has changed, but uh, thanks for that and thanks for having me on and special thanks for mentioning Too Many Men. We're pretty proud of that. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a fantastic show. You, uh, Shana, and Sarah do do great stuff over there. And uh, I always laugh whenever I see the handle too much, man. It's just, <laughs> it's just so funny. <laughs> the Gary Roberts shout out is impeccable. Even if. <laughs> so, uh, Allison, like I mentioned, you are an on air broadcaster. You're an analyst, a contributor with the crack. And what has that been like with the, uh, the NHL's newest expansion franchise and one of the most exciting franchises in sports right now? <laughs> Well, yeah, I think uh, I think they're still going to come to their senses someday and realize they made a huge mistake putting me on air. But um, no, it's it's been great. And I think that having having that opportunity to be part of something new was one of the big draws for me too to be able to see something come up from scratch. I mean, you guys are around a franchise that's been around literally forever. Um, but when you can talk to someone who has seen so much and can really contain the entire story of a franchise, I think that's super cool. And uh, I think it's been also really special and rewarding to watch a team that had a plan and, you know, things don't always come into place. We see that all over sports all the time. But then to see the hard work and the intentionality start to pay off um, is also really cool as well. I like that you mentioned the uh, the payoff because in the inaugural season for the Seattle Kraken, 
uh, a lot of folks, us included, had some questions about the way they went about the expansion draft and how it kind of seemed like they they didn't maximize their assets or their opportunities like they could have with like the Golden Knights did. Uh, and a lot of people have egg on their face this year based on how things have turned around for the crack. And I mean, goaltending is a large part of that. So uh, walk us through a little bit of the turnaround from last season to this season and what's different. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, first of all, and, and we all know this, but no one was going to get the opportunities Vegas did because every GM found themselves caught with having to make deals because they hadn't contractually and asset wise planned for the constraints that an expansion draft was going to put on them. So teams were making deals left and right to keep players they thought they had to protect and so on and so forth. They were much more savvy uh, this round. But, um, you know, I think w- even before last year got underway, the analogy I was making, and, and this is my opinion, um, is that, you know, Ron Francis and his team, who I consider to be some of the most talented people in sports, let alone in hockey, this is kind of like making a cake. You get a bunch of ingredients, you see how it's going to be. And then once you see how it's going to be, then you decide what the frosting is. Then you decide, you know, is there anything more you need? And that is my take on how these two, this one and a half, I guess, or one and a third season has gone is that the front office made the decisions they did. They intentionally made sure they had room to play to find that frosting, if you will, if it was going to come later. And, you know, we saw that pay off this summer with the ability to bring in a player like Andre Burakovsky or a player like Oliver Bjorkstrand when other teams couldn't do those trades and those moves. So they had to make moves they could while making sure they had space to then add the ingredients that they realized were missing as opposed to just, you know, picking what they thought were the best and spending to the cap and going all in right from the get-go. So... I really like the phasing of it. And I think that, you know, you look at uh, someone like Ron Francis, who we know has such a strong track record developing young talent. Uh, I would suggest that he and his front office knew perhaps even better than a lot of us that what they had in Matty Beneers and what that would mean for when the window truly does start to open for hardcore contention. And so they've made a lot of their decisions and taken a lot of their steps with that timing in mind as well. Matty Beneers has been one of the most, you know, electric rookies that the league has seen. Uh, you mentioned that maybe he was one of the only ones to really know the kind of impact that he's had. Walk us through a little bit of what Matty Beneers has done for the Seattle Kraken so early in his career and the way his kind of play style has impacted their game. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, if you look at the Kraken last year, one of the gaping needs that became obvious was goal scoring. So he, of course, does that. Um, then he also is a center. And, you know, we all know the the organizations we can point to and say, look at how they got their franchise centers, and that's what their championships were built on. And they did it through the draft. So having that center strength is key, too. So there's offensive talent, positional strength. And then this is just a special player. I mean, there are multiple times where I'll clip a play and sit down with uh, our, our broadcast analyst, JT Brown, and say, JT, um, you played, like, help me really understand how he just made all of these skaters on the ice just look silly. Um, but he has the confidence. He has the, the effort. He works hard. He's always one of the last skaters to come in from practice. Um, and he has an intelligence that matches that skill. So I watch his ability to go wide if he needs to, to pull defenders away from where he's about to send the puck to his line mate. Or I watch him pull a defender in close so then he can beat him with speed and, and just create a rush down the ice. And then I watch him also take his lumps as the NHL tries to say, you know, welcome to the big show, um, and continue to play and bounce back. He has a, he has a quiet confidence to him that underlies his skill. And I think those are all many of the ingredients that, that are producing this incredible, incredible performance that even I thought, you know, an 82 game season, even the most talented that can wear on a player. And maybe it still does, but he's surpassing my expectations so far. And now I hate to to take such a hard turn here, but, you know, if you didn't look at the standings and you weren't really following the Kraken closely and you only listened to the, the Shane Wright saga, you'd think that the Seattle Kraken were in a, a hard spot. That's not true. They're in a divisional seed right now. But let's talk about Shane Wright a little bit. You know, he was a shock to fall to the Kraken, depending on who you talk to at fourth overall and it's been a little bit of a uh an up and down affair in terms of is he going to get in the lineup what's his role in the team uh when is he going to get the games in 
What has that been like from your perspective, Shane Wright's, you know, rookie season with Seattle? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously it's a story, right? And so we see this all the time, all of us who cover a a team directly. And I don't think it's intentional, but often, you know, you don't watch a team up close. And so you pull out a storyline and you focus on it. And it's funny, having gone to the West, having been in the East, it is true that if you're not out West, you're not necessarily taking in as much as you maybe should about those teams. I mean, I, I didn't stay up for all the late games when I lived in Eastern time. So you're going on broad brushstrokes. And so all of that is to say, this was the storyline. This was the narrative. It was started in the draft because of the quote unquote drop down the rankings. Um, but you know, the point I always start off with Shane is that if you look at this year's draft, there are only three players from this year's draft that have seen NHL time. One of them is obviously Slavkovsky, who's in Montreal, and they're doing well, but this is not a team that's looking to contend. This is an organization that also has a plan, but respectfully is has a place where they say, yeah, we're fine just developing a player. Uh, the second one is David Yurichek, who played for the Columbus Blue Jackets, who have been decimated by injuries, and they're calling up everyone, including probably the equipment manager from their AHL squad at this point because they've been hurt so badly. And the third is Shane Wright. So he's there um, in part, and I would suggest no one said this, but the Kraken didn't know necessarily how good they would be to start the season. And maybe it was a situation where he could get a little bit more time that might allow for in-game development as well as practice development. Now you're a team that's playing to truly win games. Every standing point matters. So you can't allow for as many lumps maybe as you could with if you're one of those other two organizations I mentioned. And we all know about the CHL rule. Um, you know, this player is probably too good for the CHL. So where does he go? He can't go to the AHL. Um, and then when he finally can go there with some creativity through the crack in front office, he does really well. Um, so I've liked what I've seen from the player. I've been very impressed with his ability to take what has come, particularly with the spotlight. Um, he did well in the AHL. He's going to Worlds, which I think is going to be really good for him. He came back with a lot of confidence from the AHL. And when you look in particular that when he came back from that AHL stint, he came back and played one NHL game against Montreal. And if you want to talk about making the spotlight as bright as possible, there it is. Um, and not only did he handle it well off the ice, but more impressively, he played well on the ice. And that's when he got his first NHL goal. So I think what we're seeing here is a player who's developing like a lot of top players do. It just so happens that the organization he's affiliated with doesn't have all the tools that other organizations have to get that path going as smoothly as, as they might like it. But the player, I remain confident in the player. And then now you have a one, two punch down the center, right? Long term, which is pretty exciting for Kraken fans. Um, it, the hype was over. I get it, but I think it was overstated. So flipping over to you, Allison, uh, you know, the broadcaster and, the person, as long as we've known you, you've always had uh, so many impactful roles within the hockey community, within hockey media. And I think the big story that we talked about years ago would have been how, uh, in your work writing, you did a beautiful job, not just understanding, but translating hockey analytics into, you know, for lack of a better word, a, a layperson's terms, so that, you know, dummies like Brad and I could really <laughs> understand what was happening. And it seems now that you've kind of taken up that mantle and translated not only in your work contributing for the Seattle Kraken in writing, but also as an on-air broadcaster. Has that been, you know, really intentional uh, uh, of a goal for you? It it wasn't, actually. Um, All the blame goes to my um, executive producer at Root Sports, John Bradford, and then um, our editor-in-chief at the Kraken, Bob Condor, who said, hey, come try this out. Let's see if you can do it. Um, But I will say... It's been very rewarding. And I think what's important is that, you know, every fan base and every market has a different personality and a a different match for who they best want to hear about the game from. And I'm thankful that the Seattle market is one that seems to fit with the way I like to think about the sport, understanding it, not just from the magic of it, but also the why of it. And, And I have really enjoyed the opportunity to be able to share what I see from my perspective a little bit more readily through in-game broadcast as opposed to just writing. So that's been really cool to be a little bit more reactionary and also maybe, 
it's wonderful to dig into ideas and go deep like we do on writing, but sometimes just that quick little comment to say, see, this is why that worked or this is why that didn't work. Um, that's been really cool because my, I've always been motivated about the why. And so to be able to share that with other people who seem to be interested in it has been really rewarding for me. Yeah, just to follow up on that, one of the things that I find your broadcast has done extremely well this year is incorporating, we'll call it modern hockey terms and modern hockey philosophy, but again, in a simple way to explain it to dummies like us. Um, I remember a clip went viral from your guys' broadcast uh, a few weeks ago where you guys were explaining why Seattle, how Seattle was attacking a 1-2-2 defense. And to 90% of fans, you say a 1-2-2 system or a 1-3-1, you lose them. But as the clip went on, it was so masterfully explained that I think everybody could understand what was going on and why it was impactful. What I want to know is how much of that stuff in terms of systems is done from prep work is done from talking to people around the organization, or is it more read and react based on what you're seeing on the ice as it's happening? Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit of everything, honestly. And and first and foremost, full marks to um, our in-game producer, Ryan Shaber, um, who produces that show. And then obviously John Forsland and JT Brown, who were on that game with me, what you're really seeing there is kind of the conversations that um, all of us will have while we watch practice. And, you know, John is is a legend, um, but he's so still curious about the new things about the game. So he'll bring that insight. And then you have JT, who's played the game, but played it so recently, right? So he understands the game in a newer, fresher way, if you will. And he's interested in hearing what I see. I'm interested in hearing what he sees. And we're also interested in really healthy debate. So I think the biggest part of all that is the relationship that our group has. And then before a game you do, you sit down and you game plan and you say, what am I going to be watching for? What am I going to be looking for? What do I want to talk about? So you have those topics kind of already on tap. You go back, you prepare for them. You think about the points that you might like to make about that. And then you just react to what the game gives you. And I think that Again, that comes from the magic of, um, and it's my deep appreciation to have the professional and relationship and friendship with both John and JT that we could just have that conversation. Although the clip is kind of funny because if you watch it, all it sounds like we're saying is one three one one three one one three one. That's like a clip across a full sixty minute hockey game. So um, it was, and I will say it is. We did get some blowback of people saying, "Well, everyone knows what the one three one is. I don't know why they're focusing on this, but." For our fan base, I think that was right on target with with where we should be, and 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 I enjoyed the heck out of it. You're you've been like I think I mentioned earlier, you've been between the benches, uh, kind of at ice level between the glass as the season has gone on. You said it was only a few times, but has that offered you a more unique opportunity to see the game unfold, or are you very much uh, no? You like to be up in the catwalk, the gondola type view uh, to be able to kind of understand uh, the way the play kind of plays out. Yeah, I mean, I think it's different. I, I appreciate both. And, and I've said this a couple of times. I tell new fans, you should always see the game from two places. And the first is high up in the low bowl in the corner. So you can watch play develop and see how the game is played. And then you should always, if you can, at any level, sit down by the glass so you can see how fast the game is. And so I think that's been really cool for being down at ice level. And I think what we miss for all of us who sit up high, literally, on in our chairs and pontificate on what we think a player should have done or didn't do or should have seen, when you're down there, you really get an appreciation for what the players are seeing and what they're dealing with and how they're preparing and how they're communicating with each other. And I think that's really important because as much as you can say, oh my gosh, there's a gaping shooting lane, please shoot the puck right now, you can also say, I can't believe they say I'm just going to shoot it here. And then that is the puck that goes in. So the appreciation for for the incredible talent that actually comes to life, given how sometimes little they see um, and what that means in terms of how much you have to appreciate why teams have systems. Um, that's been really cool for me being down there. Okay, Allison, you know better than us here. So true or false, there is a better kind of acceptance and marriage between, you know, let's call it new age advanced analytics and... Uh, kind of the classic eye test, although I, I think those are reductive terms, uh, in NHL organizations now compared to maybe the last time we talked a few years ago. Oh, I 100% agree. I think 
you know, I think that now when people try and start the, oh, you know, whatever the numbers say or whatever, it's, it's just kind of sloughed off where before those of us in the numbers community, we get all rankled and try and start a debate. I think, I think we all know that if you are going to do your job well, and, and we just had a, a hockey analytics conference out in Seattle, and uh, we were honored to have Ron Francis be part of a panel. And he said, you know, I'm going to watch the game, but I'm also going to look at the numbers because what's most important is when those don't jive. I want every single piece of the puzzle to come together to make sure that the puzzle fits. And if the puzzle doesn't fit, then I start to dig even deeper. But I, I particularly again with a new organization, I think they don't have a lot of that history and baggage of maybe having to clear some mindsets. Um, but I think we're past the, the, the biggest debates of that time. At least I hope so. I'm tired of them. <laughs> oh, and it's, it's funny because the simple answer seems to be, you need to have a firm understanding of both. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, finally here, just to jump back to the Seattle Kraken, uh, there have been all, obviously the, uh, the valuation of franchises has been all over the news recently and, and the Kraken have already surpassed, I believe a lot of teams, including the Red Wings location, location, location seems to be the story here, of course, but what's it been like just to, uh, jump on board with such an exciting story, a new franchise birth, uh, from nothing and, and seeing Seattle embrace, uh, uh, hockey as a city. Yeah. I mean, I think what's been cool and, you know, Detroit and so many markets are like this, but this is a market in Seattle that's already very savvy to professional sports. So the Kraken had to come in and be on their A game and everything is just first class. I, I would hope everyone, if they can, can get out to see Climate Pledge Arena. We're very proud of it. It's gorgeous. Um, they do everything top notch and they do everything intentionally to match with what the community of Seattle looks like and is all about. And so I think that's been a big part of why it's been meshing. It's really, it's really cool for a first year team. You walk around and you see the signs up in the bars and people walking around in jerseys and in merch on game days and even on not game days. Um, so to watch the excitement and, and I've said this too, the players all raved even at the end of the last season, there were a lot of games when that team maybe didn't deserve to have all of their fans stay to the brutal end and they always did and they always cheered and they were behind them even in a COVID restricted season. And that's who I'm most excited for here that right now with this start is that these fans were so incredible last year. Now they're getting rewarded with seeing not just winning hockey, but exciting hockey and, and fun hockey. And um, the Kraken are doing a lot of things right right now. Okay, Allison, we've kept you long enough. Uh, I believe Seattle and Detroit play in the new year, so that might be good inspiration to talk again. But for now, folks, this has been Allison uh, Lucan of the Seattle Kraken, uh, as well as Root Sports Northwest. Uh, follow her on Twitter at Allison L, one L in Allison, uh, Too Many Men uh, podcast. Allison, thank you so much for joining us. It is my pleasure. I'm so glad we got to catch up, guys. Welcome back. That was our interview with Allison Lucan. Always great having her on. Uh, incredible insights and I think the best in the business in terms of combining the numbers, the eye test and translating it for dummies like us. So thank you to Allison for uh, jumping on the show. Okay, there's been a lot that's happened. This has been I think there's a, you know, hours long conversation about what changes with the Red Wings outlook. We'll do that I think on episodes to come as we know more about their injury status. And there's been a ton of NHL news as well. The Board of Governors meetings uh, that have happened um, so we'll we'll cover some of it today, but this is going to be an on, go, ongoing discussion. Let's start with the salary cap. Uh, basically, a a quick oversimplified uh, summary here is that the players, due to f the forces of the pandemic and lost revenue, essentially owe the owners a bunch of money that they elected to take in advance to not lose too much during the the COVID lockouts or or sorry the COVID um, uh, work stoppage time. And they have to pay that back. And it's in escrow. So for the cap to go up as much as people want it to, and as much as I'm sure the league wants it to, the players have to kind of clear that balance first. And how do they do how do they do that? More hockey related revenues. Every ticket you buy, piece of merchandise, whatever. The players and owners to each take a certain percentage of that revenue. And basically what the players are doing is paying a certain percentage extra to the owners to clear that backlog. Anyhow. The salary cap was projected to go up $1 million for next season. A very small increase, not a lot. Teams are still going to be in a bind. 
Gary Bettman came out and said it could be as much as $4 million or more if the escrow balance is cleared. The update we got is that it looks like it's going to land just short of the mark by like 72, let's say $150 million, depending on how positive or negative. And that's going to seem like a lot of money, but it's actually, it's closer than what they anticipated. So if it lands short by rule, then yeah, the salary cap isn't going to jump by any more than $1 million. Not by rule, but by you know agreement or, or, or convention. There's a few different things that can affect that. Let's say all major hockey markets are the ones to make the playoffs and each series goes seven games and it's just the the best you know market rivalries in the world, then yeah, that's going to generate a lot more money uh, because of revenue sharing. It's going to impact it. So like, you know, a Toronto Montreal series and then a Toronto, like j- just think of the markets that are spending in same dollars. Can't wait for that Dallas Florida cup final. <laughs> well, maybe. Um that could change it. You know, the Canadian dollar being different uh, in its performance against the American dollar than what's projected could change it. Anyhow, what is potentially going to happen now is that the Players Association is going to come to the NHL and say, hey, look, we're not going to clear the balance this season, but by next season, we're going to blow past it based on, you know, how much better we've done in revenue than expected. Instead of only going up a million, and instead of going up more than $4 million, let's come somewhere in the middle. Let's increase the salary cap two and a half million next year. And the way we'll account for that is, you know, when the next projected big increase would come, it'll come off the top of that. So basically just spreading it out as opposed to doing very little now and a lot in the future. Yeah. Uh, how is the, the number one question on everybody's mind is how does this affect the Red Wings? It's almost better for the Red Wings if the cap doesn't go up. Yeah. That's the reality of it. Uh, the Red Wings are one of the more healthy teams in terms of how their salary cap uh, situation is structured right now. Um, as we've seen, Eiserman hasn't exactly been the most aggressive in terms of going out and getting bad contracts and really weaponizing his cap space outside of uh, the Mark Stahl trade a couple years ago. So my short answer in how does this affect the Red Wings, I don't. it doesn't. It really doesn't. Maybe it gives Eisenman a little breathing room yeah. in Larkin negotiations, but they're negotiating in an eight-year contract. He doesn't care what Larkin's cap hit is next season. He cares what it's going to be in their window. So I, I don't even think it affects that all that much. So, yeah, it's better for the league as a whole if it goes up because then obviously there's... Uh, we might get a little more entertaining offseason and trade market because then teams who are right up against the cap might get a little more flexibility to make some moves. Actually, now that I've said that, the one scenario I could see where if projections are like to go up two and a half, three million next season could make the trade deadline a little more aggressive. And all of a sudden, if a team's looking to trade for Bertuzzi and potentially extend him, that might make them a little more confident in that. Yeah. Potentially, not by leaps and bounds, but maybe but yeah for the most part it's uh going to be good for entertainment value in the off season the the fans someone made a good point they're like why would the fans care and it yeah like you said Brad it really depends on a fan of what team you are and it, there's a there's confounding and and very complicating uh complicated implications for Detroit who yeah they want the leverage but they also have contracts so we'll see how that plays out um there's also conversations and these will be fleshed out more in future episodes, but there's conversations about things like, you know, starting a play in series before the playoffs. They're talking about changing the schedule so that you see a little bit more of what we saw during, you know, the, the pandemic games where it was very regional focused. It was very, you know, back to backs or teams play series, essentially like mini series, like and it's not because of uh, convenience of travel. That's some of it. That'll save money. It'll it'll make uh, it easier for the league to operate. But it's all about generating revenue. Edmonton, Calgary, eight times a year is going to make them a boatload of money. Edmonton, Calgary, eight times a year is honestly great for the fans. I don't think there's any reason to be sparing about that when, you, when you're playing 82 games a year. So that's another avenue that I'm interested to see what they come up with. I hope that this doesn't come at the sacrifice of, you know, every team in the league have a having a decent shot at seeing other team stars. Like I think fans and buildings should be able to see, you know, Connor McDavid, Alex Ovechkin, whoever more than once every three seasons or something like that. I just hope they don't go to that extreme. Yeah. If they balance it out by saying, all right, well 
forget conferences. You're going to play your own division six, seven, eight times, and then you're just playing every other team twice, regardless of what conference or division they're in. Sure, I'm okay with that. Like, I don't give a crap if they play Washington the exact same amount of times they play Seattle. That makes no difference to me whatsoever. So if it's something along those lines, sure. But, yeah, if we get deprived of, you know, getting to see everybody all the every year, that sucks because – Connor McDavid going to Arizona, going to Florida every year. That helps those markets. Yeah. So I'm a fan of the rivalry setup if it doesn't come at the expense of losing superstar games. I have a lot of passionate opinions on playing series, and they're not necessarily consistent. We'll save that, you know, for future conversations. One more thing that I want to talk about, though, you know, talking about um increased revenue one of the things that the nhl is obviously doing is their digital board ads and you know there's there's two schools of thought yeah there's two schools of thought i fall in the camp of i think they're pretty bad on the eyes and and they are something that the nhl should be very careful with especially the moving ones i think they're pretty terrible atrocious even um and it's a step too far and there's some who are saying i don't care it doesn't affect my viewing experience i think people are just whining and they'll get over it those are all valid, both valid, per- perfectly valid. Gary Bettman, when asked, said something to the effect of, uh, he didn't just say some folks have no issue with it. He said, you know, our internal polling shows that it increases the watchability of the game, which I have a small rant about this. He knows what he's doing there. He absolutely knows what he's doing there. He knows how absurd of a statement that is, because even if you don't care at all about the ads and you think Ryan or Brad are whiny losers. And I know there are a lot of you out there. We heard you last night and that's fine. He knows that no one actually likes board ads. That's like saying someone likes when their sock gets wet through their boot in the winter time. Like it, it's just not a thing. Certain people can be unbothered by it because they're resilient and grown ups, and they can just go home and change their socks, but no one seeks that out. He knows how terrible it is uh, of like a, how stupid of a statement it is. And what's it, what's he doing? It's a power move. He's showing off. Because he knows this won't change. It's a power move to display to the Board of Governors, to ownership, to say, hey, this increased revenue stream isn't going to go away. And look how I can just almost literally hand wave the complaints away. Because it's not going to change. The NHL is never there. Unless something catastrophic happens or, you know, money is starting to going to start disappearing from their wallets. They're not getting rid of the digital board ads. They're here to stay. They're, they're a, a, another boon for them in terms of bringing money into the league's pockets. It's his, it's, that's, that's his job. That's his company line to say ridiculous shit like that because he knows he can get away with it. It benefits because he's, he's hand waving away the issue and it does, whether you like it or not, it does enough to quell the complaints because people see that and they get dispirited and they get, you know, uh, complacent because they're saying, well, there's no way this is going to go away now. And so I'm going to stop whining. And then the complaints go away. It's a calculated piss off move by Gary Bettman. And my only response is. This is why Gary Bettman gets booed at every single cup ceremony. Everything I might I, I said about you know why he did it might be true, and the the one rebuttal that fans will always have is the booing at the cup ceremony. It's not fair, but that's that. Okay, uh, we're gonna jump into overtime on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast if you want to support the show. Our patrons are the only reason why uh, this show can run the way it does, grow the way it does. So they're the real heart and soul of the show. And if you're a patron, and if you haven't uh, since you signed up and you need to, update your address. Check the Patreon page. We give you instructions on how to do it. Uh, hope you do that ASAP. Okay. Uh, Glenn Brabham says, yes or no? Pull Yarvi for Zadina straight up. Give both guys a fresh start and hopefully the spark they need. What are your thoughts? No, not straight up. It's because the contract, right? It's because the contract. I think Zadina is a little younger and honestly... Pooley Yarvey's not producing with McDavid at times. I, I think Zadina still has a bit more value, especially when you factor in Pooley Yarvey's recent statements. Yeah, it's it's almost ridiculous because it seems like stuff in the margins that wouldn't even matter, but for the cap space alone. Yeah. Like, ignore the if, potential, the cap space alone, you don't do if that. If that's a starting framework for a trade and Edmonton throws in like a pick or a prospect, sure. Like I'm not super passionate about either way, but yeah, yeah, one for one, probably not. 
Aaron says, All Star, the All Star game is only a couple months away. What are your guys' picks for the Wings All Star player, assuming everyone is healthy? Is there a possibility we get more than one player? Possibility we get more than one player, yes. I would say it's unlikely. And if it was just one right now, it's Vili Huso. Uh, I think there are, there's, I mean, everyone healthy, completely healthy. There's three strong contenders Larkin, Ronick, and Huso, one at each yeah, position. Yeah, they all. Should be there, but again, that's through the Red Wings colored glasses. There's a lot of other teams With having very good players. Yeah. A lot of really good goalies. Yeah. And if Detroit's not in a playoff spot, they are not going to get three players. That's just the reality of it. Uh, I love this question, and you'll understand why by the end. Uh, Brandon Bruce Gus says, Hey, Winged Wheel podcast uh, guys, after watching that Minnesota game, do you think Detroit needs to sign an enforcer to square up with someone like Revo? If so, who do you think would be worth a free agent signing or a trade? Congrats on that third star, Brad. You're also the third star of this podcast. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, screw you. And uh, absolutely not. Do not. Minnesota is the only team that employs a Ryan Reeves. That that role in the NHL is dead. There are ways, you, as we laid out earlier, you can respond to a Ryan Reeves without having to waste a roster spot on a Ryan Reeves. It provides some tangible advantage to Minnesota now. It provides tangible against Detroit. How do you think that game would have went last night? And instead of playing Detroit, they were playing Tampa Bay. You know, that's what I mean. Yeah, like, they in, in, in games where it's playoff caliber, that, that stuff gets moved to the margin. Yeah, because let's not forget, he was playing for a playoff team before he got traded to Minnesota in the Rangers or, you know, a competitive playoff team. And they weren't playing him. That's why he's in Minnesota, because Minnesota's season was going off the rails, so they needed to send a message to the team, and that's how they did it. To be in Minnesota's defense, the team did seem to respond to it, but still, when push comes to shove, he is not helping your team win games, unless it's against a very depleted Red Wings team or something of the like. All right, I think we have time for about one more here before you wrap Uh Tom Hughes says, hey, guys, you talked about the Wings winning. Tom's a brand new patron. Welcome, Tom. Uh, hey, guys, you talked about the Wings winning against teams they should beat, and we don't have the offense against top teams. Do you think once healthy, we can make up for the current setback and steal some points? Yes, but it might be too late. Yeah, that's that, what I, I agree. Like That's why the we, when we were talking earlier, the time frame matters so much because they can't afford to have an entire month where they're a bottom feeder. They just can't. When Larkin, Verona, Bertuzzi, Hronik are all back, yeah, I fully expect the Red Wings to steal at least a few games from the Torontos, Tampas, you know, Floridas of the world. But without them, they probably won't do it very often. Yeah. In previous seasons, when the setback happened, it didn't really matter how healthy the Red Wings got after that. It just continued to spiral downwards or at best plateau. The Red Wings have the talent now where I can see them, like you said, Brad, Brad, clawing back some points, moving in the right direction. There won't be enough runway left if it takes too long to get healthy. And that's the difference, though, is is the Red Wings won't, have not had the personnel and the performance from key players like Philip Ronick to get that clawing back in action in previous years. So it might be small solace, but the they could at least make it interesting. Um, they, it would be way more interesting if they were in the West. The East may... Like they're running out of games, which is ridiculous to say. They this went two one on one and lost ground. Yeah, in the West, this would make a lot more sense. We're talking about Vancouver having a shot in the playoffs in the West. Vancouver would have been cooked in the East. It would have Bedard would have already moved in. <laughs> okay, uh, Brad, you have a little one downstairs who is eager uh, to go about her life rather than listening to her uh, dad and uncle upstairs, you know, spewing bullshit. So uh, we're going to wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, whether you agree or disagree on the Ryan Reeves hit, uh, we'd love to hear your comments. Uh, if you're especially angry, I ask that you we you DM Evan directly. Um, but no, genuinely, the discourse is great, and this is part of why the hockey community is great by having these discussions. Not everyone's always going to agree. So thanks for bearing with us. We'd like to thank our all of our listeners, new and old, the sponsors of this episode, NordVPN, and additionally, all our name level supporters on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Ake for Armchair GM slash Genius, uh, Nick Perks, Terry Driver, the number 69, Cry and Ryan, and his been a Sam Jamathong. 
Glenn Brabham, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, Brandon M., Carl Brutina Nanoluski, Chimmy, Chris Ball, Chris P., Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets and Tempe, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight Probert, Red Hot Ronick, Hassam Al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joseph Barry, Kalen Wood, Kevin James, King Tone, Las Ensaladas Picantes, Mar- Marcus, Matt McKay, Nadelkovic, goalie number one, Nicholas Fritz, not the best Ryan, but still not the worst Ryan, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Send It Seawolf, The Podcasting Couch, Ululating Yodeler Warble, Arjun, weirdo, Venom, Zachary Rogers, uh, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, number one Detroit Red Guys fan, Adam, I wish I could finish like Ernie, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landeskog, Ben Barron, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Carl Thames, Connor Leighton, Darren Fick, Philip Zadiz Nuts, Chronix Handlebar, James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingles, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Linda Hull, Logan Burgos, Matt Keeler, Matt S., Loyal Soldier of the Cheesebag Army, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Overload the Slot 60% of the time, it works every time, Thick Rick, and Aaron Hudson. Thank you all so much. We'll talk to you Sunday. We'll have everything back for you. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.